Coming up on this edition of Ableton on... Oh, are we ready? Yep. Coming up on this edition of Ableton on Air, we interview the new commissioner of Dale, the Disability and Independent Living Office, of, and she's commissioner, uh, Dr. Jill Bowen, uh, originally from New York. All that and much more when Ableton on Air starts right now. Welcome to this edition of Able Den On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lawrence Seiler. Um, on this edition, we, focuses, we focus on Dale's services, disability and independent living services of Vermont. We would like to welcome Dr. Jill Bowen, uh, Commissioner of Dale. Thank you for joining me on this edition. Great, Able happy to be Den here. On Air. Um, so, you're all the way from New York and also from Philadelphia. Tell me the missions and goals of Dale. Okay, well, let's start with um, Dale. Then I can give you some history and how I found myself here, yeah, sitting how, here with you today. How did you today. find yourself <laughs> in, in Vermont? Well, first, let me just say that the, the mission, um, the, the vision, the goals of Dale uh, are part of what drew me here. Um, and the mission which I will read out is to make Vermont the best state in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. And um, I love that. Uh, I saw that and uh, was drawn to it and wanted to learn more about what that meant um, for the folks in, in Vermont. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the history of why you came to Vermont. You're originally from New York and Philadelphia. And uh, you've worked with departments of health. You've worked with numerous, uh, um, you know, uh, offices within both states and other states. Tell us um, some of that work and what really drew you to Vermont. So let me say I am now just at my three-month mark mm -hmm. uh, of joining as commissioner here and coming to Vermont. I actually moved to Vermont one week before I started. Um, and so I am still very much in the, um, I, I feel very settled in and very welcomed and I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Dale, the Agency of Human Services and the, the people in general that I have um, engaged with in these past few months. Um, and it's really been a, a really great start for me um, here. Uh, but I am a psychologist by training. I am originally from New York. Mm -hmm. um, I say that from New York because <laughs> that, I'm originally from the Bronx. Actually, okay. So the Bronx is one of the boroughs I have not lived in, but I have lived in Queens, uh, born in Queens, actually. Um, I have lived in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, and um, so I am a psychologist by training. I uh, also from Long Island. I did my schooling there, got my doctorate there, and began working in. The, for the public health system. And I was drawn to work in the public health system um, really from a sense of uh, my, my family upbringing uh, around public service. Um, and so those early experiences really um, inspired my interest in, um, in psychology, in social services in general. And so uh, my training, um, resulted in my work in the public health system in New York City. So the health and hospital system in New York City is the largest municipal hospital system in the country, which provided me with great training ground and great opportunity to grow in multiple different spaces. Now, I'm going to really start this interview. What disparities or what, because New York is having problems with a lot of um, services with uh, people with disabilities, and uh, you know the hospital system has changed. So, from your training in New York, how did how did you bring that to Vermont, knowing that you know there are issues with um, it's a long laundry list, if you will. There's issues with the system when it comes to people with disabilities. So, can you explain mm -hmm. the cross over? Yep. Why you uh, you know what? What made you train in those states and then come here? Yeah, so in New York, um, 
in addition to the health system, I um, became lean trained, uh, which put a sort of a systems and business um, uh, improvement hat on top of the clinical hat. Um, and um, I ended up working for the mayor um, in New York City. Which mayor was um, it? De Blasio, and as a senior advisor for mental health and it, instituting system change. Um, it was a, a, a really um, huge program um, called Thrive NYC, which was a, a system change for, for folks with mental health challenges and, um, and um, systems challenges, social service, and uh, substance use, and just the overall overarching system um, and how it uh, impacted, what, trying to address some of those barriers to access, um, barriers to equity, those sorts of things, and beginning to address things uh, such as social determinants of health, which now we really think more of as social drivers of health. And through that work, I connected up five and a half years ago um, six, six uh, and more years ago, actually, um, into Philadelphia, where a lot of this innovative work was being seeded. And so with the last three and a half of my six plus years in Philadelphia, I was commissioner of the department of what's called the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, in which there was this um, uh, real over- um, arching system because the Medicaid system was part of that um, disability system. The Medicaid system is a mess. Um, well, it had a, there was an interesting approach to Medicaid in um, Pennsylvania. There's a, and particularly in Philadelphia, and an interesting one here in Vermont as well. But the work that I did there. So I want to go back to your specific question because across all of these different areas in which I have worked, and I have done direct service, and I have done work with criminal justice intercepts, and I have done work with um, trans major transformations of systems. But what runs through all of that is, um, is stigma, inequity, um, and barriers to access, um, barriers. Explain some of the barriers that, hmm? that Ex are, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, please. But explain some of the barriers that people with disabilities are facing now that you could help with. Yeah, so um, uh, I want to talk about those social drivers, the, you know, the health-related social needs. Um, so when people ask about, ask me about, well, um, you talk about a number of those. I'm going to say what some of them are. Okay, so housing. Without housing stability, any efforts around um, success is going to be impeded, right? If you don't have stable housing, you're not going to be able to success, to, to be successful in treatment or to be successful in um, achieving your goals in life, right? Um, job, economic opportunity, right? Job and economic opportunity means independence. It means um, fulfilling um, purpose. Mm -hmm. It means dignity. It means being part of community. Um, so food insecurity. Um, you, so between housing, um, economic opportunity, um, job and workforce um, access, um, and um, you know, th these, are the, these are the major barriers, and you can see it everywhere. Um, one of the things that really drew me around aging and um, developmental and intellectual disabilities that, that made me so interested in the position here in, in um, Vermont was that I saw during the pandemic, I led during the pandemic in Philadelphia. During the pandemic, um, a number of system inequities um, rose, right? Not that they weren't there, but they were increased, and highlighted. And offices also closed. People with disabilities needed to get services and some things weren't available, which made it really difficult. So that's, that's why key. They, yeah. That is key. And one of the things that made me so um, drawn towards, again, that work was that um, the DS, the Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities System, crumbled faster than other systems and on the backs of families um, because many of the folks were now at home and the services that they were relying on were not available um, to them. So right away you see that that system's 
a very fragile system, it's a vulnerable system, and it can crumble pretty easily. So that was one of the things I was really interested in working on and supporting. Um, the aging piece of it, Pennsylvania has an aging population not as much as Vermont. We know that Vermont has about a third of the population over 60, um, and what is needed are really, really good plans. And I saw a stigma and discrimination working um, there that were preventing people who were eligible for certain services from getting them because either they were complex, people are whole people. So you can't look at them through a narrow lens. Right? If you do that, you are right away you are not going to be meeting the needs of the whole person. Um, and so I saw that time and time and time again being elevated um, it, during the pandemic and in the sort of post-pandemic era we find ourselves in now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's talk about um, today being, well, I mean, of course, this is going to air after today also, but today is the anniversary the Americans with Disabilities Act, what makes that so poignant when you hear the anniversary? Because, um, you know, it took a lot for people with disabilities to get through what they needed to get through. You know, you had problems with institutions. I'll give you an example. Um, Brandon State Schools here in Vermont, New York State had that horrible Willowbrook State School, and uh, Philly had Highbury. That this, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what um, makes this anniversary so poignant? But we still have a lot to get through. Yeah, I think it's really important on you know ADA Awareness Day, which comes on July 26th every year um, since 1990. So this is the 34th anniversary when President uh, President um, Bush, G H uh, W Bush, um, signed this into law. Um, and while we are sitting here recognizing the challenges that exist, that stigma is still alive and well, unfortunately, and part of um, our systems, and that there are folks who are um, still not served necessarily at the level in which they need the service, um, the ADA was amazing. And so we also need to recognize the importance of that legislation and that act um, which uh, really focused on things like equity and accessibility and put the power of the law behind it, um, that it was not okay. Um, it was not okay in our society for folks not to have access to services, to not have equitable access to the, to the basic things that they need. And even today, as we move into the digital more fully and fully and fully into the digital world, we need to make sure that access exists in that world and that realm as well. And this is an important day to highlight um, some, of the, some of the gaps that still exist. What's causing people with, dis with, people with challenges Challenges people with special needs not to have access to very important services. Yeah, I know so, I'm jumping around, but go ahead. No, this is fine. This is a good conversation. Um, I think that uh, there's a number of things. When you think in the digital world, there's a couple of barriers. One is actual digital divide in which there aren't the tools that people would need. Then there's the information gap, which is having the knowledge uh, and the um, skill to be able to maneuver in that space. Um, you know, and the other is whether the platforms themselves and the user interfaces are um, accessible to folks with varying um, challenges. And uh, yeah, what if you live in a rural community and you don't have access? So bingo, right? If you live in a rural community and you don't actually even have the access, that's a huge gap. So you may be isolated in multiple ways, um, not just, you know, um, you need to travel to a particular, so transportation is another social driver, right? Transportation and education are other social drivers um, to the ones that we had spoken about before. Um, but the social connectedness is very important. Um, folks who are not connected are not 
um, a full, they are not granted full access to the community. Community is where healing happens. Community is where wellness occurs. And it is a critical part. Um, so, social isolation is very unhealthy for us, for humans, for all humans. During the pandemic, a lot of people were shut in, which I want to bring up. Yep. Yeah. So these are, these are the gaps and barriers that need to be overcome, and it's being worked on all the time. We're in um, the space where assisted technology is growing, mm -hmm. right? And there will be increasing, continual increasing opportunities. We, may, we need to make sure that folks get access to those opportunities. Yeah. Um, so bring me to some of the there's important services. You mentioned employment. Um, Higher ability has been helping me. Uh, explain the importance of um, great employment for people with disabilities and the reason why that program's in place. Because there's issues um, in the past. You know, you, you have something in, in the Vermont regs called uh, Section 14C. Mm -hmm. Which means sub minimum wages. You know, Willowbrook was an example, you know, or workshop wages were an example throughout our country uh, in terms of people with disabilities getting adequate employment. Um, so, explain the importance of higher ability, which is a Dale program. So, higher ability, I can't help but smile when you yes. raise higher ability, right? And it just, just keep in mind, I'm, I've only been here three months, but um, I have really learned so much about what higher ability is, is doing and how well um, they do it and the full range of types of programs. So there's a tremendous focus um, on folks with de developmental disabilities, but also on youth um, and youth transitioning and opportunities to, to really um, assist folks with getting into really good um, uh, good. Uh, economic opportunities through employment. Now, when you talk about employment, we're talking about employment. We're not talking about uh, workshop employment. We're talking about employment. And regardless of what people's challenges are, um, their ability to do the work and their, um, the, their right to have full, um, full payment for the work that they're doing is extremely important if you are a full participant in the Amen. community, right? Mm -hmm. As a full participant in the community, you look at this from a whole person, strength-based approach. What the person brings um, to the business is just as important as what they get from it. Um, and so the connections with job opportunities, the training, the support for success is, is just, it, it cannot be understated how important that is to people's whole sense of wellness, being part of the community and having economic opportunity. Um, one of the programs that they have been um, talking with me about is career building for folks. So there's one thing to have a job and it's another thing to think in terms of what uh, how do I grow within my job? What do I need to succeed and grow within my job? Um, just like anybody who looks towards a career, everybody um, should have the economic opportunities that come with employment, with career opportunity. And that's true of any and everybody who has um, a disability. Everybody comes with challenges. Everybody in the comes with challenges, and the ADA was very important in terms of making sure that people get the accommodations, level the playing field, and make it possible for people to succeed in these jobs. It's not just good for the people that are doing the work. It's good for the people they work with, for the businesses they support, and for the community within that, which that what happens. Are the, since you said that, what are the misconceptions especially around employment, and we're talking about the ADA. But what are the, missions, uh, the misconceptions around people with disabilities when people first meet them? Bosses might be scared, maybe, uh, of hiring people with disabilities or make excuses, or this job doesn't fit you, or you're too overqualified, and you 
Go ahead. So a lot of that is stigma and the preconceived notions about um, what folks with various um, disabilities are capable of doing, um, missing the contribution that they will be making to the organization. And often with some experience um, hiring these folks, um, the, the employers really have a turnaround um, experience. It's really important for them to tell their stories as well. So any preconceived notion about, about what a person can do um, because of some some part of their um, experience having certain challenges um, is is un, um, unfairly limiting to what the potential is and fulfilling that um, fully. So there is work that um, needs to be done that that higher There's ability work does. Be done. Well, but even even in the in the in the in the now and in the future, right? To to be um, you know helpful for those who still have preconceived notions who um, with a stigma and the discrimination just is part remains part of the culture and we need to lift it beyond that every person who is employed and successfully employed which is thousands of people at this point with higher ability doing all of this array of work break down those stigmas um, and it's important for us especially on ADA Awareness Day to um, to highlight and recognize that so let's talk about um, their services for the deaf through Dale. They've been on the show. Can you explain a little bit about that program? Yeah, um, so the, the services for um, the deaf um, are part of sort of the messaging and the information sharing and making sure to have coordination and connection for the various services that exist within the community. Nothing Dale does um, really happens without external partners. Um, that is very clear to me. When I interviewed for the position, I had great opportunity through a, a fairly long process to meet this, um, some of the stakeholders in the community who are the partners um, for Dale. And, and also advocates in the community. There's a lot of self-advocacy. Yep. Advocates, partners, advisory board members. There's a whole community um, that for, with which Dale is a part and, and um, with, with whom Dale um, partners. And um, in, the, um, in the, the deaf and hard of hearing community, it's really important for those um, services and opportunities to be coordinated and Dale takes, a, takes an important role there. You also raised um, blind, visually impaired, so there I, is... I, in fact, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I do get certain services. Um, yeah, the Division for the Blind is a wonderful... Agency. Fantastic. Yeah. Right? And it's fantastic. partnered with the show also, so it's, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, and it is one of the divisions within um, Dale, and they are leading a, a, a multi, um, multi-disability, multi-sector, multi-partner uh, plan um, called um, Pathways to Partnership, and um, it's a really great opportunity. Called what again? Pathways to Partnership, I'll, I'll get more, uh, P2P, so I'm hopefully saying it properly, um, is a, a great opportunity for um, work to be done, uh, off, especially with the youth, uh, in terms of transition work for, the, for those um, who, uh, particularly for youth who are in transition or youth in you know, transition from um, school into, into the community or um, are, are um, challenged with various disabilities. So that's wonderful. But the whole approach is really um, related to jobs like hireability also for, um, for folks who um, are challenged with uh, blind or visual impairments who also have great opportunity to connect to their community. Um, I haven't mentioned this, but I do want to say that when you say, like, what do you, what do you bring to this? Um, you know, my vision has often um, been uh, something that I call tech or TEC, mm -hmm. which is trauma, equity, and community. T for trauma. So it's, it's to address trauma, achieve equity, and engage community. That is what is impactful across the board here, right? Because Folks who have disabilities or who are aging Vermonters have experienced some trauma. In some degree, we all have, as we've gone through the pandemic, the floods. If there's yeah. trauma in the community. <clears throat> um, like I said, the pandemic, I mean, uh, um, I'm only going to mention this once. 
But telehealth, <coughs> excuse me, telehealth is not for everybody. Because during the pandemic, if you needed to go to a doctor, you know, people were scared and stuff like that. But certain doctors you cannot do online. Mm. Okay. For example, I had an issue with um, epilepsy during the pandemic. So I had to go to my epilepsy um, specialist. Mm -hmm. Not all of it is online. So take me through some of the issues that the pandemic brought and how people really came together to try to yeah, change I, some of that. Well, I mean, first of all, the pandemic highlighted inequities in um, how people were able to, some were able to work from home, some were not able to work from home, right? Some were able to access uh, the the medical continuum and others weren't. Some, some were able jobs to- jobs were completely closed. Right. Um, and some were able to use teleservices successfully and others um, weren't. So there's a whole um, array of information we need to glean from that as we, as we look forward, as we work forward to make sure that we're as equitable as possible in, in all of our um, efforts. I think it is really um, important to differentiate where, where teleworked well and to hold on to that, um, because that moved things forward in that realm that probably would have taken many, many, many more years to get to the point where um, there were services that could be provided through telesupports. Um, but then, to your point, there are either a, a emergency level, and so you know, folks would end up going to an emergency room as opposed to perhaps their doctor's offices. Um, but there are also just certain types of interactions that one needs in terms of their health that require person to person. So there is the, this requires person to person and this is um, people may prefer person to person and then there's this works best person to person. And I think that we need to understand that and sort that through and make sure that we have those uh, paths forward for people um, and not have any limitations. That's, those are access issues. Just like any other barrier to getting what you need in the way that you would choose to get it, preference is so important. In, in Vermont, it has been highlighted and incorporated, like um, Choices for Care, for example. It is really important that people have um, choice and, and um, you know, uh, opportunity to choose. Tell me about choices for care and long-term um, services. For yeah. Those that really need it. So for older um, Vermonters, there's a, you know, there's a range of types of programming um, that support everything from nursing home to, you know, residential care to in-home services. And um, Choices for Care um, and some of the other programs for older Vermonters, um, really has options to build the programs that um, are the preference wherever possible that are the preference of, um, of the individual. Um, and so, and I see that in a lot of the programs here. Um, the, the Medicaid programs that Dale manages um, are really um, built individually um, like the, the, the plan is an individual plan, um, person by person. So for folks who are looking for services, whether it's uh, developmental services or other disability services, or for older Vermonters, there's a process that includes, you know, evaluation, assessment, eligibility, and um, the opportunity to create a, a program particular. Um, and that is also done with our, you know, the AAAs, the the um, the areas, um, uh, the area agencies on aging, as well as the um, uh, the the programs that exist to support uh, folks with um, developmental services. It's a it's a really um, interesting uh, program here in in Vermont. Okay, um, so let's really hammer home, we have a couple of minutes left, okay. uh, but let's really hammer home um, why, you know, because why does Dale really exist? 
because, again, there has been problems, and there's still 41 states, 39 to 41 states that institutionalize people with disabilities, mm -hmm. which is horrible, and developmental centers, and et cetera. Why does, it's a two-part question, why does advocacy exist, and why does Dale exist in Vermont? Yeah, so um, Dale, that's such a great question, Lawrence, I really appreciate that question. Um, and sorry for jumping around. No, I have enjoyed this. Um, so the Dale is part of the agency of, for, of human services, right? This is very, this is important that it's part of uh, multi-agencies that work um, for the health and human services of the people of Vermont. Uh, critically important because the, the systems um, are complex systems. Uh, people are whole people, I've said that um, before, and there needs to be integrated programming. So the being part of the Agency for Human Services is really valuable. And uh, in my three months, I've really um, gotten to know the other commissioners, um, the, you know, the health and the, the mental health and the children and families, right? All of whom have overlapping uh, responsibilities. Again, that's because um, of people being whole people, uh, they don't. We don't exist in silos. So our systems, uh, you know, systems that exist in silos are, are, are have difficulty. Um, and then what, you, what is meant by a silo? Like so, one way of looking at um, somebody. So if we look at someone with a, a developmental disability, does you you are you know you're developmental disability and that's all I focus on and I don't see the whole picture. You could be someone with developmental disability who is also an older Vermonter. You could be someone who has uh, great skills in carpentry. You could be someone who is uh, a father. You can be someone. So having, um, you know, uh, blinders on and only seeing narrowly is not good and one of the things that um, can come from um, from, a, from a program like Dale is being able to integrate those things. But basically, and I say this to everybody at Dale since, since I became commissioner uh, three months ago, which is that we all, regardless of what you do on a day-to-day -day uh, basis, have one job. And our job, all of our jobs, is to serve the people of Vermont who have need of our services. That's it, you know, period, end of sentence. And so we exist for that purpose. We are the people's agency for disabilities, aging, and independent living. And uh, that is our re you know, reason for um, existing. Okay. And one last question. Words have changed over time. Uh, back in 2015, um, Obama uh, created through, there's a family, um, their last name was Rosa, so it was named as Rosa's Law, which meant that you couldn't call someone re uh, that horrible word, um, the R word, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say it once, retarded is not supposed to be used anymore to describe someone that who has a medical condition. In other words, lunatic, feeble-minded, etc. How has that history changed? Because, you know, advocacy is very important when it comes to the special needs community. Yeah, and it, it's advocacy and self-advocacy and folks with lived experience and families with lived experience who inform that dialogue, who inform the language. Language Words are very powerful. They're infused over time with emotional um, meaning. And it is important to be aware of that and for the, the words to shift. It's purposeful when those words shift. They reflect, um, they reflect the way the system shifts. They reflect the way people are expressing what they want for themselves. Um, and they have moved, in general, um, if I look at the different kinds of words and how they have moved, they have moved to more strength-based. They have moved to separate the words or the descriptors from uh, as if that in and of itself defines a person. Um, so use, the way language evolves um, 
must be through the eyes of the people who, to whom it is attributed. And it needs to have the power behind it of people who are empowered to make decisions about how we um, as a whole agree to talk about um, some, some, um, some things and to make sure that we are not talking about someone who is their disability. It's not the whole of who they are. And language is an important part of how we message um, and how we engage in a strength-based whole person approach. Wow, oh, boy, you made me think. Oh, and oh my gosh. Last thing, the future of Dale. What is the future of Dale now that you're commissioner? Yeah, so um, again, the folks at Dale are pretty amazing. Um, I have gotten to know, I know um, several of them. I am still um, getting to know some of them who I have not met. The leadership team is uh, phenomenal. This is a very mission-driven, passion-driven um, group, and it's wonderful to, to be there with them. What I'm still doing is learning more about what happens out in the field. So I am currently on a listening tour, um, and the importance there is to get to know people who are served by Dale mm -hmm. and people who um, provide the service to Dale, where that happens, um, where the magic happens in the community. Um, and that's going to inform the, the work that we do going forward. I am a systems thinker, which means I look at the system as a whole. And to, to improve systems work um, is really important to understand what the contributions of the system are to some of the problems and to shift that so it's an equitable um, system. And to look at where trauma is impacting and where we're falling short on making sure that community engagement is as strong as possible. Um, last and Final question, uh, because my my wife will uh, get upset at me if I don't ask this. What? Then it's um, the most important question. Most you've asked. important question: <laughs> staff, staffing, staffing hospitals, maybe a group home stuff like that. There's a uh, acronym: uh, DSP, Direct Support Professional. New York has them. Other states have them. Mm -hmm. Vermont has them. Paying staff, uh, whether you're a, a traveler, um, you know, working and, and going back and forth, um, minimum wage is just not going to work for certain things. You got to pay family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people people have families. Um, is there something working in Vermont that is going to change? Um, paying a staff member to work with a person with a disability with who should get a higher wage? Yeah, and there are, there are some things that have already been rolling here in Vermont. Um, but I do want to say um, it's really um, the workforce issues are paramount. Okay. There are, these are not small issues. The workforce um, is, challenges are, are kind of... Um, really significant levels. Because people need to eat, too. Well, there's, a, there's the um, workforce challenges in, um, you know, having um, appropriate uh, living wages. There's also just the vacancies and the difficulty in affordability. And just the, you know, when you talk about the wages, that's part of the affordability issue because on the one side, it's what, um, you know, what you can afford based on your income, but there's also what the expense is for some of these social determinants that we're talking about. So um, housing is a big one, right? And so workforce challenges are like multi-sector challenges to, to make it possible for people to, um, to come to work here, to be able to recruit folks to come into the kinds of positions that we need across the entire um, social service sector and the continuum, um, well, but people, also for people, people to stay here. Positions, uh, some people in those positions have to go 
to two or three jobs just to make ends meet, and it shouldn't be that way. Right, and the marketability, and you know, so this is a course, I saw this in, in New York, and, and uh, certainly in Pennsylvania, and here in Vermont, it is a, a, a real challenge to, um, to be able to recruit and retain staff, and to also remind people about why we do this work. Right, and that, that's some of what we've been doing um, at Dale too, just even internally and to think about the next generation of workforce and making sure that we're paving the way for them to be successful and to, be, to see the value of this work and for, you know, for compensation across the board for um, folks um, and the affordability for them to be able to come, to be able to stay, um, and to have fulfilling opportunities for themselves and their families. Well, I, now I'm ending now. Um, I would like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Ableton on Air. For more information on Dale uh, and their services, you can go to www. Um, is it DaleVermont.org? Correct. Yeah, or it's dale.gov um, or dale.vermont. Uh, so how about we make sure that I get the exact thing? It's dale.vermont.gov. Okay. So D-A-I-L, Dale. Yes. Dot Vermont, dot gov. Okay, so for more information on Dale and their services, the Disability and Independent Living uh, Services in Vermont, you can go to um, www. Dell.vermont.gov. Um, and for more information on Ableton on Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. And also stay tuned. Um, uh, starting once a month, we are going to be live in Barrie at the Fly, Fly on the Wall production studios in Barrie, uh, thanks to the partnership with J.D. Green. Uh, and for more information on that, you can go to Facebook and YouTube and uh, click, the, and you know, we, we will be live there starting uh, this coming Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. Um, and this program now will be uh, also simultaneously airing as well. Um, so, for more information on Ableton On Air, you can also go to www.orcamedia.net. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time.